If you're hear us, uh, could you start the recording? I did. Okay, thanks. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the session on nonlinear layers. Uh, the first talk will be given by uh, Shaham Hazul Sadeh from uh, Radboud. And yes, I'm French, as you have noticed. Uh, he's going to talk about low latency Boolean functions and bijective S boxes. Thank you, Leo, for the introduction. I'm Shaham, and now uh, today I will uh, talk about my recent studies on low latency S boxes. Uh, S boxes are one of the main components uh, in designing block ciphers and also in many other symmetric crypto primitives. They are actually n bit to n bit uh, vectorial Boolean functions. To uh, make it clear, what I will call later by coordinate functions, uh, I mean each output function of uh, a function. And by component functions, I will uh, mean. Uh, any linear combination of these output output functions. We usually are interested in uh, balanced S boxes. That means each output value appears uh, uniformly, and uh, it is already known that it is equivalent to uh, that each component function of this uh, balanced S box is uh, a balanced Boolean function. Uh, we, we study these functions by their properties. Uh, we have cryptographic properties of S boxes. We have uniformity to, uh, as a metric to uh, resistance of the S box against uh, differential cryptanalysis and also linearity that is uh, a metric for uh, its resistance for uh, linear cryptanalysis. And also sometimes we use algebraic degree uh, as a metric for uh, resistance against higher order differential or cube attacks or such as uh, such as uh, attacks. But we need to implement these uh, ciphers, these functions in uh, some platforms. Uh, here I will uh, pass some of uh, proper hardware implementation properties, uh, area latency, we have power uh, or gate count and gate depth. Uh, we cannot measure these uh, properties exactly, except we uh, really implement them. Uh, we can synthesize them, but still they are not really precise. Uh, so we come with uh, some solutions to mathematically study these properties. We define some uh, circuit complexities, such as gate count or multiplicative complexity to measure some of these properties uh, mathematically. Uh, it's not easy, it's not usually easy to uh, study all of the Boolean functions uh, with respect to these properties. So we consider some equivalency relations uh, to reduce the amount of uh, studies uh, to make it easier. We have bit permutation equivalence that is, uh, Two functions are equivalent under this uh, relation. If we put uh, bit permutation uh, mappings in the input and output of one function to get the other one, we can extend it uh, to extended bit permutation equivalence by adding some constants in the inputs. Or uh, with linear mappings, we have linear equivalence uh, relation. And again, we can extend it to affine by adding some constants to the uh, linear relation and to extended affine equivalence, which uh, extended by adding a linear mapping uh, to the output of one, one of the functions. Uh, many of the cryptographic properties of SPOX's Boolean functions are invariant over extended affine equivalent uh, relation. And uh, amongst these uh, five equivalency relations, it is the most strongest one. You have less number of classes to be studied uh, compared to the other relations. However, for uh, implementation properties, they are only, most of them are only invariant over bit permutation equivalence. And bit permutation equivalence is the uh, weakest one amongst these uh, five relations. And 
since it is uh, the weakest one and there are many number of classes to be studied, it is usually uh, not easy to finish uh, searching, uh, studying or classifying all the Boolean functions uh, for these properties. Uh, however, it was uh, shown by Axel Poshman and Gregor Lander that by accepting some small uh, tolerances in the properties and also uh, since these functions are uh, implemented together with some other uh, uh, some other circuits to build large rest boxes together, we can uh, consider these uh, properties which are bit permutation equivalent to be uh, semi semi invariant over uh, bit extended bit permutation equivalence. Uh, here we will talk about the latency comp uh, latency of these boxes. It is the time uh, required to compute all the output bits of a function, uh, a circuit, not a function. Uh, this property is circuit specific. Uh, since for, for one function, there is no unique uh, possible circuit to realize it. From uh, one circuit to other circuit, this can be different. And not only uh, security specific, it's also technology specific property. Uh, for the same circuit in different, realized in different technologies, it can have different values. So it's not really easy to uh, understand what is, uh, not understand to know what is the latency of a function from the beginning. Uh, previously, gate depth complexity was the metric to model uh, mathematically model latency of a uh, function, and it is the minimum possible value uh, for the lungs, pa uh, lungs pass of uh, the circuit through all possible implementations. Uh, but it is always possible to implement any functions within two gate depths uh, if we allow any uh, input size of input size for the gates. Therefore, we only we usually restrict ourselves for the gates that has a, a finite number or input number of one or two. Uh, here, uh, I bring the the minimum possible latency that you can achieve uh, for these gates, two bit gates uh, in fifteen nanometer and fourteen nanometer uh, open cell NAND gate open cell open cell libraries. Uh, NAND is always the, uh, the fastest one, and XOR or XNOR is uh, usually the uh, slowest ones. And as you see, it is uh, quite twice of the latency for NANDs. This is not coincidence or not specific for this technology, for these uh, libraries. Uh, this is uh, based on the CMOS, how you realize uh, XOR or XNOR in the CMOS technology. So uh, based on this, we found that gate depth complexity is quite a loose uh, metric to uh, compare latency of Boolean functions. So we came up with another metric, we call it latency complexity. That is the gate depth complexity in the base of NAND, NOR and inverter but uh, we don't count the inverters in the uh, gate count. And the reason comes uh, why we don't, uh, I will explain it here now, why we don't count uh, inverters. We first show that uh, any Boolean function with latency complexity D can be realized within this uh, construction. You have D levels of uh, gates, uh, NAND or NOR gates, and one uh, starting layer of buffers or inverters. And input of these buffers are one of the, uh, AIs are one of the uh, inputs to the function. And as you see, there's only one level of uh, inverters or buffers. And uh, com comparing to latency of all uh, uh, circuit, it is uh, much smaller. Also, uh, we will implement this function together with other functions. So these NANDs can be combined with the previous uh, layer of the circuits. 
and also in the low latency implementation of uh, uh, functions or uh, let's say ciphers here uh, we need uh, usually a buffer a layer of buffers to modify the voltage of uh, uh, amplify voltage of uh, signals coming to this layer so we can uh, just say we don't consider these buffers or uh, inverters in this layer uh, this structure also helps us to find all the uh, Boolean functions with uh, latency complexity. We only need to, uh, considering that we already found all the functions with latency complexity D minus one, we choose two of them and then combine uh, these two functions through a NAND or NOR gate. And then we will have the set of all possible uh, Boolean functions with latency complexity D. Uh, we, Propose the uh, we present a uh, quite complicated uh, algorithm to find it uh, more efficiently. But uh, simply saying it, we only find these uh, functions up to the uh, extended bit permutation equivalence. So we can uh, instead of going through all possible uh, choices for uh, two pairs, we only need to consider one of them to be representative and one uh, can be any uh, Boolean, Boolean function with latency complexity D minus one. Then we combine them, but only with uh, NAND gate, not both of NAND and NOR. And this is because of uh, equivalency relation in the output. Then we compute its representative and add it to the uh, set of uh, Boolean functions with latency complexity D. Uh, using this algorithm, we were it was possible for us to find latency complexity of all uh, Boolean functions up to five bits. And also we could uh, find all the uh, Boolean functions up to eight bits with latency complexity four. Uh, having this set of uh, representatives uh, defining their uh, input numbers and uh, latency complexity, we could also uh, introduce a new algorithm to find all the possible implementations for a Boolean function. Uh, we uh, consider that f is the function that we want to find its all possible circuits with the minimum low, uh, with the minimum uh, latency depths and G to be one, one candidate to be uh, its subcircuit that uh, together with another function that can make it uh, together with a NAND or NOR gate uh, can realize the circuit for F. If G uh, has uh, such a property, it has to fulfill the condition in line seven. And uh, if this condition is fulfilled, we save it, save G function in a set of A NAND. And also if uh, G can be a candidate for uh, realizing, uh, realizing a circuit for F function together with another function through an NOR gate, it has to fulfill the condition in line uh, nine. Uh, going through all these G functions and building all the uh, these two sets of A NAND and A NOR, uh, we go through all pairs in this uh, sets. And uh, if there is a pair of G and H that can uh, fulfill uh, condition in line 12, we can uh, uh, say this is a possible solution. And then we go to find uh, all circuits for G and H. We continue this that uh, until the step that uh, the uh, subcircuit for subfunctions are only one bit uh, functions. And then we return the uh, trivial solution of it is the invariant or its uh, negative value of the invariant. Uh, we also uh, studied latency complexity of previously known S boxes. Uh, 
we did quite comprehensive search through all the uh, SPACs that is used in the literature for three bit SPACs. What is used is already uh, has the, uh, has latency complexity of three, and four bit SPAC for four bit SPACs, uh, except for Midori's SPACs, uh, uh, all the other SPACs has uh, latency complexity four or five. For five bits, except Kachak's SPACs. Uh, which has uh, latency complexity is three and linearity is 69, uniformity eight. All the other SBOXs, such as APN SBOX, uh, like in Fidus 5 SBOX, it has, uh, they have uh, complexity equal to five. For large SBOXs, there is no uh, SBOXs with uh, latency complexity. Uh, less than six, except speed is a box that has uh, latency complexity four and linearity 24, uniformity eight. So this was a motivation for us to search for uh, SBOXs with low latency complexity. For this, we, uh, we chose our criteria uh, in this order. We need low latency complexity for the SBOX. Uh, we need minimum possible linearity and then minimum uniformity. And also then uh, later we add algebraic degree uh, to be quadratic or to be maximum as possible. Why we uh, prioritize linearity over uniformity is that uh, we can check for linearity of a S-box by having uh, its coordinates, uh, but this is not possible to check uh, for uniformity of SBOX by only having a coordinate function of it. Uh, our method of building SBOX is uh, we do steps over uh, choosing the coordinates of the SBOX. Uh, I mean, considering S is our SBOX and if I's are its coordinate, we first choose F0, we check for criteria, we choose F1, we choose, uh, we check for criteria, and then until the end that we have the last coordinate and we check for uh, uniformity criteria and uh, say, okay, this uh, S is acceptable. Uh, We consider F as the set of all Boolean functions satisfying this criteria, uh, uh, criteria for latency and linearity and also the, uh, the algebraic degree. And also uh, we show by uh, R1, the set of all representatives from this uh, set F. Uh, Christophe de Cagne, uh proposed the uh, basic uh, algorithm for this uh, uh, method. There, uh, we first uh, set the uh, our sets S, R2 to Rm to be empty sets. Then uh, for each vector Boolean function F prime from previous representative sets, and for each uh, coordinate F from set of all Boolean functions, we uh, compute their uh, composite function, and then we check for the criteria. If it, fulls, if it fulfills the criteria, we add it to the set S. And when uh, we finish this loop, uh, we go through all the functions in S to check if they are new by being uh, equivalent to others or not. We check, uh, we choose one of these F1s from S and uh, for each F0 from uh, this representative sets, we check if they are equivalent or not. If uh, it is equivalent to one of these, uh, so oh, this F1 is not new, uh, we go to other F1 from this S set. But if uh, for all of uh, these F0s, we find out it is not equivalent to any of them. So it's a new function and we add it to uh, set of RI. We fulfill it, uh, we finish this loop, and then we increase i, go to the higher dimension of uh, search. Uh, here, uh, we need to save uh, the set S, and also uh, we need to uh, check equivalency of uh, all, uh, between all possible F1s and F0s. 
uh, this saving S is uh, maybe possible for the case of, oh, uh, okay, I will make it faster. Uh, S maybe needs uh, a bit uh, more uh, memory. Uh, in the case of uh, bit permutation equivalence, uh, we modified it in the following uh, algorithm. Uh, for each composite function f, uh, we check, uh, we directly com uh, compute its representativeness and then add it to the uh, set, to the representative sets, and then we continue uh, to the next uh, uh, dimension of building S boxes. Uh, here, the, the complex, yeah, the computation complex and memory complexity will be like this. But consider that we don't need to classify uh, uh, classify all the functions, and we are interested in only finding uh, some S boxes with uh, criteria, with our criteria. Uh, we modify this algorithm to following way. Uh, we go through loops. Uh, oh. I'm over time. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, we uh, introduced uh, quite a new uh, algorithm and uh, with efficient to be uh, uh, to be good in time, uh, time of the uh, complexity, not time of presenting. <laughs> uh, and uh, based on this, we find quite new, uh, quite good S boxes to be uh, low, uh, low latency. For the case of uh, late com uh, latency complexity uh, to be four, we found uh, uh, six bit and seven bit S boxes uh, with linearity two to the N minus two and uniformity two to the N minus four. Uh, yeah, all the uh, results are pos uh, are publicly available in this uh, address. You can check, and if you uh, need any uh, tools or related uh, code, uh, just send me an email, and I will provide it. Thank you for attention, and sorry for being late. Thank you, Sharam. Um, do we have a, a very quick question uh, on the chat here or in Beijing? Yes, uh, Christina. Please wait a moment. There is a question. Okay. Uh, hi, Sharm. I have a question. Um, is there a, some link between the um, low latency and the differential properties of the, of the S-Box? That is also a conjecture for me. <laughs> I studied, but uh, I didn't find any uh, relation, uh, but probably there is. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so please, uh, from Beijing, what's the question? Uh, I want to know how to measure the time of computing the representative function. You mean uh, what is the time for uh, computing a representative function of a giving function, right? Oh uh, yeah. Uh, what I did is just uh, very simply. I put all the uh, possible input mappings and possible output mappings and uh, compute the uh, outcoming result and see if it is uh, smaller than already saved uh, representative. And searching through all these, uh, we see if it can, uh, what is the final representative? It is like finding a minimum through uh, an array of integers, something like this. But you can al always speed it up. Is that answer your question? Oh, okay, thank you. Okay, and uh, with that, we can uh, thank uh, Shaham again. Now we're going to have a talk 
uh, which will be given by Lorenzo on invertible quadratic nonlinear layers for motivation. <laughs> Uh, for MPC FHE ZK friendly schemes over FP to the N, and it's a joint work with uh, Silvia Onofri, Marco Pedicini, and Luca Sozzi. Please. Thank you. So, okay, I did this work when I was at Radboud University. Now I'm in Bokum. Um, I'm going to start this uh, work with a bit of uh, motivation and uh, to explain the goals of this, uh, of this work. So as you may know, there are new applications like uh, MPC, uh, Fourier morphic encryption, zero knowledge that require symmetric primitive, prim primitives from symmetric key, uh, cryptography. And these primitives are usually uh, defined over prime fields because uh, this application works over uh, prime fields. And P is usually a very large prime integers, for example, to the power of 128 or even more. And what is important in that is that uh, these primitives uh, minimize the multiplicative complexity, which means uh, uh, the number of multiplications of no linear operation that are required to either compute or verify uh, these schemes. Now, um, due to the size of this uh, prime, we cannot uh, pre-compute and store the no linear oper operation, for example, the, the S-box. Uh, for example, in AES, we can do that. It's just 8 bit, but here the prime is too large, so we cannot do this. So, this means that we need a uh, nonlinear operation that um, uh, admits a very simple algebraic expression. So, very simple doesn't mean low degree, it just means a uh, simple uh, expression. For example, we have power maps, uh, which are invertible if the exponent is co prime with p minus 1. They Dixon polynomial, which are generalization of the power maps, and, are, and that they are co-prime if uh, um, P is co-prime with P squared minus one. Other functions that can be set up via the Legend function, or for example, the uh, minus one to the power of X operator that we proposed last year at FSE. But you can also set up nonlinear layer by using uh, phi style or uh, line mass scheme. Uh, probably there are others, these are uh, known. Now, if you focus on the first two, for example, uh, they, they are nice, but um, there could be a problem when we use them in practice. And the reason is that uh, in this application, we use several primes. So we have to change the exponent in base, uh, based on the prime. And this is not very uh, good in some cases because this means that we have to change, for example, the security analysis. For example, the growth degree can change depending on the exponent d. Or for example, uh, the density of the polynomial representation can change. So we have to adapt the security analysis depending on the exponent. And the other point is that uh, in some cases, these uh, primitives could be efficient for some exponent, but not for others. And for phi style and uh, line schemes, uh, they are, let's say, partially linear in the sense that some output uh, are linear function of the input. And in some cases, this is not also uh, very nice. So the goal of this paper uh, was to look for new invertible, let's say, full nonlinear layers over FP to the N that cause N multiplication, so in general of degree two, and if possible, they have uh, high degree inverse, so for preventing meeting the middle algebraic attacks. Okay, so if we have a function over FP to the N, uh, this is the generic function, so each output uh, yi is defined as the output of a function fi that takes in input uh, x0, x1, and so on. Um, as you can understand, we cannot analyze all these cases because they are too many. So what we did is to focus on the cellular automata. So we define S as a cellular, as, as a cellular automata. So as a sheet invariant transformation over an array of n elements that are defined uh, by a single local map. So in this case, n is the size uh, of the feed where we are working on, and m is the size is the number of input of this function f. So to be a bit more formal, we say that uh, the shift invariant uh, lifting function as f over fp to then is defined by is induced by the local map f. Um, if uh, it is defined in this way, so each output uh, y i is defined as, as f applied to x i x i plus one and so on. So we have a single local map and we just uh, uh, use this local map to compute all the possible, all the output. Just very quickly, why shift invariant? Well, very simple, uh, this function commute with the uh, shift function transformation. So if we apply the shift function and then SF, we get the same result as if we apply SF and then uh, the shift function. 
Now, why we focus on these particular uh, functions? Well, because we know that uh, in the binary case, we can actually construct a bijective function of this form. For example, if you have a look at the Yon thesis, uh, one example is the chi function. So the chi function works, takes three input, uh, three bit in input and return a single bit in output defined in this way. And S chi, where F, F2 to the N is invertible if N is uh, odd. This is not the only example. There are many other, many other examples in the Yon thesis. For example, uh, the second one is invertible if N is co-prime with three, and the last one is always invertible for each N, uh, greater or equal than six. So in our case, uh, we focus on the prime fields. So we assume P to be uh, a prime and that is equal to three and F to be a quadratic function that takes an input uh, M element and return a single uh, FP element. So we have SF defined as before. So we have a single local map and we define uh, all the output via it. And we ask ourselves if it is possible to find F for which SF is invertible. And if yes, if this is the case for any N and every M. So actually in the paper, we just focus on the case in which M is equal to two or three. And uh, okay, let's start with a necessary condition. Uh, so we have F is a quadratic function from FP to the M to FP. So that one is the um, algebraic representation. So the other interesting point is that uh, the indices of alpha are exactly the exponent uh, of X0, X1 and so on. And in the following, I'm going to define alpha D as the sum of the coefficient of the monomial of the grid D. So for example, alpha two is the sum of the coefficient of uh, the monomial of the grid two and alpha one is the sum of the coefficient of the monomial of the grid one. So necessary requirement for invertibility is that uh, alpha two is equal to zero and alpha one is different from zero. Uh, why? Well, very simple. So if alpha, D, alpha two and alpha one are equal to zero, then if we apply F to X, X and so on, this is always equal to F zero, zero, zero. So it's very easy to set up a collision. If alpha two is different from zero, then again, we apply F to uh, the same input. We get uh, a function of degree two. We know that this function is not invertible so we can set up collision. Okay. Uh, so first result, uh, let P uh, a prime, let M equal to two and then at least equal to two. So F is a quadratic function. Uh, as before from FP2 to, to, FP to, to FP. So if N is equal to two, then SF is invertible if and only if the function F has this particular form, which is basically a lima say, a, li a line messy scheme where uh, um, gamma zero must be different from plus and minus gamma one. And if N is uh, at least equal to three, then SF is never invertible. So the first part, you can see that you can have a look at the paper. I'm just going to, uh, briefly explain the proof of the uh, second part. And the idea is quite simple. Um, so if we consider collision of this form, so zero x zero x one and zero x zero prime and x one prime, uh, if we have a collision of this form, we can generalize it over fp to then for each n. Uh, in which way? Um, we just append zeros. And um, the reason is that uh, both equalities are satisfied by this free equality on f. So um, if we have a collision of that form over fp to the three, we can generalize, generalize it for, uh, over fp to the n. So this means that we don't have to consider the generic case. We can just work over uh, n equal to three and look for collision of this form. And uh, we also know that uh, we have two, uh, these two requirement on the alphas. So in the paper, we consider all possible alphas that uh, um, satisfy these two conditions and we propose collision. Uh, for example, for alpha two zero and alpha one one different from zero, we have this particular collision. And all the other cases are given in the paper. Okay, now for M equal three and N equal three or four, uh, there are function F for which uh, SF is invertible. For example, in the first case, uh, we have a function that map free element, free element from FP to FP and SF is invertible. And in the second case, SF is a fine over FP to the four and again is invertible. You can find other example in the paper. What is more interesting in the case, M equal three and then uh, at least equal to five. So in this case, if F is a quadratic function, then SF is never invertible. So the proof is similar to the previous case. 
but this is very interesting because uh, this is exactly the opposite of, of what happens in the binary case. So in the binary case, we know that the key function, the chi function provide uh, an invertible function over f2 to 10, but in the prime case, it's not possible to set up a, a shift invariant uh, lifting function that is invertible. So this is very interesting. Okay, so uh, the last thing, a concrete application. So we modify Poseidon uh, in, uh, by using this result in order to improve the efficiency. So Poseidon is a, a sponge hash function proposed for zero knowledge. The Poseidon internal permutation is defined in this way. So we have round with Burgess box layer, round with uh, partial S box layer. So we found going too much in the details. So the S box is a power map where the exponent must be co-prime with P minus one in order to, to be invertible. The linear layer is just a multiplication with uh, MDS matrix. And the number of rounds are eight for the external round, so six plus two of security margin. And the number of rounds of the partial round is proportional to log T of P. Now, the internal round are crucial for increasing the degree. Um, and the cost of the internal round is, uh, okay, the number of the internal round times uh, the cost of computing X to the power of T. So approximately two times log T of P. And this uh, cost is independent of T, so the size of the feet. Uh, the external round are necessary to guarantee security against statistical attacks. And here the cost depends on T. Now, if this is like 12 or 16, the cost of the external round could be also higher than the cost of the internal round. So this is not uh, very nice. So what we tried, what we did was to, sorry, modify the external round for reducing the, um, reduce, for reducing the total cost. So what we try is to try to reduce the factor that multiplies uh, in, without decreasing the security. So the original idea was uh, to have uh, a locker map and by using this locker map to set up a nonlinear layer over F to FP to the N. But as we saw, this is not uh, possible because uh, we cannot get uh, an invertible nonlinear layer. So what we did is just to use um, as boxes over FP to the two. So we define the state to be an even number and we define the nonlinear layer as the concatenation of S boxes over FP to the two. So the S box is just a concatenation of S prime, A and S prime. S prime is a lay construction and A is a, an affine map that uh, aims to destroy the invariance space of the lay And the cost of this nonlinear layer is uh, T multiplication. So you can find more details about uh, Neptune. So this modified version of Poseidon in the paper. So the different linear layer, uh, the explanation of the round and so on. Uh, but as you can see, we were able to reduce the cost, the multiplicative complexity of Poseidon. For example, for T equals 16, um, the cost of Poseidon is approximately 65% more than the cost of uh, Neptune. Okay, that's all from my side. So I'm just going to summarize and to propose some open problems. So P, uh, when P is a prime, um, if you have a quadratic function from FP to them to FP, then the shift invariant lifting function as f over f p to the n is not invertible in these three cases. So m equal one and n bigger or equal than one, m equal two or n bigger or equal than three, m equal three and then bigger or equal than five. So we propose this open conjecture that given f as before, as f is never invertible is n is bigger or equal than two times m minus one. So you can see that the three cases before are satisfied, uh, but we are not able to prove this conjecture for the case m equals four or, or more. Uh, we left the open problem to construct new invertible uh, nonlinear function over fp to the n that minimize the multiplicative complexity. And uh, we suggest to exploit these uh, new nonlinear layers for future design of uh, MPC uh, zero knowledge or homomorphic uh, friendly symmetry scheme. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so thank you, Lorenzo. Do we have any questions in the room in Kobe? What about the chat? Ah, you do have a question, okay. Can you show me the conjecture? So, so, so do you, uh, for the, for your proof for the first three cases, you mainly found uh, they are clean if we choose the parameters in this way, right? Mm -hmm. 
So what's the difficulty to uh, extend such a approach to for the case, uh, like the conjecture, the M is large and N is large, the main optical. So it's difficult to construct some cleans or, or something like that. Um, yeah. Um, so for N equal five, we mostly use this uh, approach. So to work like with N equal five and then to extend the collision. But in some cases we cannot do that. We really have to find a collision over uh, the entire state. So, so it's not a structured. No, exactly. Okay. There Thank are a few cases, but uh, it could happen. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, do we have anything in Beijing or in the chat? No. Okay. Uh, well, then let's uh, thank uh, Lorenzo and all the speakers of the session. And that clock is a bit ahead of time. It's actually more like 41. So I think we can still meet at uh, 4.50 uh, for the next session. Thanks.